Okay, thank you, team, for leading us in music today. <laughs> Wish we could uh, sing in here every week. It's just, I don't know, it's we've got acoustics or something in this building that you don't need a whole lot of people and you really hear people singing out. And I always enjoy, enjoy doing that. I hope you all also, you know, you take some time to, to think about the words that we're singing because these words are so powerful. I'm going to try to draw something from that into the message today. This morning, if you have your Bibles, I want to just encourage you to open them to Hebrews again. We're going to go into Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Once again this week, we kind of spent three sermons now on Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse uh, 26 to the end of the chapter. Whenever I go camping, I always forget something, right? There's just, I don't think there's been a time. One time we forgot a lighter. By the way, you really need a lighter when you go camping, because how do you light like, anything without a lighter? <laughs> That's a really important one to not forget. Um, bring your Bible when you go camping. Uh, bring your uh, creativity and your, your just desire to see God's wonderful creation, because it doesn't matter. It seems like wherever you go, there's beauty everywhere, even in Saskatchewan, right? Saskatchewan's got some, some beauty, too. So um, anyway, I've got to you know, take a shot at my brothers and sisters from Saskatchewan. Um, yeah, Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, today, what I, this week, what I forgot, if you're wondering what I forgot, I forgot my, my eyeglasses, so, so it's not that your pastor can't read, it's just that um, I'm, I'm getting up there, I'm, I'm in that age now where yeah, eyeglasses help, but, but I can still read, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll go along here and it'll be okay. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, I think that's a 26, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> It says here, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished? who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who is treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you'd received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you, would, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and how we can open it. It does expose everything that is true about you. And some of the things that are true about you, we are so thankful for. And we are just naturally warm towards because we love to hear about how you're the one who goes for the, the one lost sheep and leaves the 99. We love to hear about how you, you know, bring so much forgiveness to us prodigals who have wandered away and you've brought us back. And We've sung today about how your love is just chasing after us, and we're thankful for that. But Lord, then we also see the other side, the side that talks about your wrath towards sin. And this is a heavy um, topic, and yet your word doesn't shy away from it because it's true. That is how you are towards sin. And um, Lord, sometimes we just kind of skip over these passages because of that, because we're not necessarily as naturally... Um, warm toward these truths but nonetheless they are true about you and we want to know you for all that you are as you're revealed in your word that as we get to know you better and better you would become more and more 
the men and women of God that you created us to be. And so, Lord, as we open your word today and we look at this passage, may you just encourage us, uh, even in some of this harder verses to look at. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you felt like giving up, where you were maybe going for a long hike and you kind of thought, oh, this is going to be so much fun and, and um, we're just going to hike up this mountain and, and, you know, you got into the first hour and it's like you're not even a third of the way there yet and you're going, what did we think about here? This is not a good idea. Or one time I can remember me and the boys, we went hiking in Jasper and it was March and uh, the snow was deep. And we thought it would be fun to still, you know, it was a warm day. It was actually quite sunny and, and everything, but the snow was deep. So if you ever stepped a little bit off the packed snow, like your leg went like up to here in, in, in deep, wet, heavy, cold snow. And of course, now your shoes are full of snow and everything. We went as far as we could, but we finally gave up. We, we probably persevered and gave it a good two hours, but we finally said, you know, enough of this is enough. Or this is not the time to be hiking this trail. We'll have to wait until the snow melts. And, and uh, we, we kind of gave up. Um, there's been other times where we've hiked and we've, we've done well. We've hiked right to the top and we've seen the incredible views that are there. But you know, the Christian life is, is a little bit like that. It's, it's, like, it's like a hike. And it's a long, long hike. And there are going to be times in our Christian walk where we're going to feel like, I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to walk away from this and, and go back to maybe what I'm more familiar with or what I, I once believed. And... Um, the, the, the author of this book of Hebrews is, is facing his recipients of this letter. And he's saying, guys, don't give up. Don't give up. Giving up is a really, really, really bad idea. We're not talking about just sort of packing in a hike and, and uh, you know, trying again another time. But we're talking about this is, this is, this is the way. And this way isn't always going to be easy. But you got to keep going. you got to keep going. When the going gets tough, the tough have got to keep going and have got to persevere. The author here at Hebrews is kind of like a coach, a good coach. A coach who knows how to, you know, push the buttons on his team, if you will. He knows when to challenge them. He knows when to kind of like, come on, boys. Come on, girls. Let's get serious here. We got to focus right now. We can do this. And he also knows when to remind his team of all that they've gone through thus far. And because of the victories they've already seen, they can keep seeing more. And that's kind of what he's doing here in this passage that God has inspired our author to write. We keep referring to him as the author because, as I've mentioned several times already, the, the, uh, we don't know who the, Hebrew, who the author of Hebrews is. There's many different suggestions, but that's all they are. They're just suggestions. This passage that I just read is the, for the fourth time, though, where the author, you know, he's doing a, let's get serious here, guys. Let's focus in. This is, this is what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is going to be something that you really want to not just think uh, in one ear and out the other. You want, you, want, you want to zero in on what is being said here. Um, and what he's doing here is he's warning us about this thing called apostasy. What is apostasy? Well, apostasy or an apostate... I, I wrote something down here from a definition from it. It says an apo apostasy from the Greek word apostasia means a defiance of an established system or authority, a rebellion, an abandonment, or a breach of faith. In the first century world, apostasy was a technical term for political revolt or defection. Just like in the first century, spiritual apostasy threatens the body of Christ today. This is not the same as backsliding. Backsliding is when, as Christians, and we may all go through a period of time in our life like this where, for whatever reason, we just kind of make some bad choices and we start to drift a little bit away from God and from His Word and from the Holy Spirit who wants to work in through us. And we might kind of find ourselves kind of getting a little humdrum about the things of the Lord. And that way we call backsliding and backsliding is actually a very miserable place for a believer to be i believe that because god loves his people so much that when we go into backsliding we tend to feel a lack of joy in our life a lack of peace we're constantly anxious about everything 
Um, I think there's no more miserable place for a person to be in this world than to be a backslidden believer. Apostasy, though, is where you, you almost get comfortable with not being with the Lord. You've turned away from the Lord, and you're at peace with that decision. That is a very dangerous place to be. And so how do we tell the difference between backslidden and an apostate? Well, we don't know for sure. That's the Lord's business. It's not ours to determine who's apostate and who's backslidden. Um, but the Lord determines that. And I think the individual can probably have a good indication because the Lord is going to make that known to the person. I guess, I guess maybe one thing I'd say is how comfortable are you with living in rebellion toward God? Like in, if, if you know you're not doing what God wants you to do, are you comfortable with that? If you're comfortable with that, it might be a sign that it's more than just backsliding. And that's not good. But backsliding isn't good either. Anybody that is backsliding, I think, would want to get out of that place quick. Because if you are one of God's children and you're backsliding, you're going to be miserable. And you're not going to ever get really reprieved from that miserable place that you're in until you repent from the direction you've been going. You're kind of wandering off the path. You need to get back on the path of following Jesus. You know, Jesus warns, though, uh, in, in how in the end times, and we don't know where we are as far as the end times are concerned, this whole period that from the time Jesus ascended into the heaven until, until now is really called the end times because Jesus could come back at any time. And it's, it's been a long period of time from our perspective anyways, but it's all, in a sense, called the end times. But Jesus said that especially as we get closer to the end, and especially as it gets closer to when Jesus is going to return for his church, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to turn apostate. In Matthew uh, chapter 24, verses 9 and 10, this is what the Lord Jesus said. He said, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, listen now, at that time, many will turn away from the faith. See, that's what an apostate is, someone who turns away from the faith. Many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. So that those that are apostate not only turn away from the Lord, but they actually turn against the Lord and against his people. But this problem is not only reserved for the end time. If we flip over to uh, 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, um, John the Apostle, there he warns us about this as well. In John chapter 2, verse 19, it says, They went out, this is referring to those that are apostate. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So in other words, there's going to be a time where there are going to be people who are just, they seem like part of God's family. I mean, they just fit right in. I, I talked about this a few weeks ago at Church in the Park. We talked about the wheat and the weeds and how the weeds and the wheat look so much alike for a good length of time. Um, but then as they get closer to harvest, it becomes more and more obvious which is a wheat and which is a weed. Well, here in John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, he's talking about this group of people. Let me just read it one more time. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So there's going to be a time where there will be people who look like they were part of us, but then they wandered away and never came back. And John the Apostle there is saying that is because they never really were part of us. They were just, they were just enjoying the experience of being part of God's family and experiencing some of the blessings that obviously go with that. But in the end, they were never really were part of us, and that's why they walked away. You see, an apostate comes to a fork in their road. And the author senses that a lot of the recipients here of Hebrews 
is are, are, are kind of dangerously at that fork. And that fork is like, okay, I have been exposed to the truth of the gospel. Now, will, now that I've been exposed to the truth of the gospel, am I going to persevere and keep going on with this? Or am I going to turn back? Because when they come to that fork, it's kind of like at that fork, they truly desire, they truly determine whether or not they are truly going to be truly a follower of Jesus or whether they're going to be an apostate. Somebody who looked very much like a follower of Jesus for even a good length of time, but then they, they wandered away. And this is, what, this is what, in Hebrews, the author has to say about these ones. And again, it's, it's, it's a bit heavy. He says in verse 26, he says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth. See, you've, you've received the knowledge of the truth. You've been exposed to the gospel. You, you even understand the gospel. So you've, been, you've received the knowledge of truth. No sacrifice for sins is left. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Now you read that phrase, deliberately keep on sinning, and I don't know about you, but it kind of troubles me because I have to, in my human nature, if somebody says to me, Don, do not touch this box. Like if I, if I see a law or I see somebody make this rule, especially if I feel like it's an arbitrary rule, and they say, do not touch this box. Like I may have had absolutely no interest in my mind whatsoever to touch this box, but now that you made a rule, and you told me not to touch this box, I have a much more greater desire or temptation to touch it, right? Like, oh, I don't know, why. What, what's really gonna happen if I touch it? Why, why are we making a big rule over not touching the box? It all of a sudden seems so interesting to me that I would wanna touch it. And I never even cared about it until a rule was made. And isn't that the way it is with sin a lot of times? Is that we don't, we, we're not even thinking about sin. We're thinking about just going about our day and doing our stuff and everything else. And, and then all of a sudden we get exposed to these rules and these laws. And all of a sudden now we're like, oh, so we're not supposed to do that. Well, I wonder what happens if you do, right? Isn't that how we are as people? And I think if we're honest, we've all done some things that we knew we shouldn't have done, even before we did them. Is that fair? Do you think, you think people have probably done that? I know I have. And so when I read this, I go, deliberately keep on sinning. Well, isn't that what that is? Is somebody told me clearly not to touch the box, and especially if it was God that told me not to touch the box, and then I touched it, I deliberately sinned. And if I deliberately sinned, and it says here, um, there is no sacrifice for those sins. Well, that's troubling. Okay, now, now that I've sort of giving you the reason why it's troubling, let me help you understand what he means here. Because he explains it. In verse 26, or sorry, verse 29, he says this, he says, how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who is treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace? That's what he means by deliberately keeping on sinning. So, um, what did it say there? Trampled the Son of God underfoot, um, treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant, and sanctified, or, and sorry, and as insulted the spirit of grace. What is all that about? How do we trample underfoot? How do we trample underfoot the Son of God? How do, how do we do that? You know, when I think about trampling something underfoot, I think about, you know, back in the 2002 Winter Olympics. 2002 Winter Olympics, the women's national hockey team, Canada's hockey team, was in this ongoing rivalry with the American women. And do you, maybe you can, some of you can think back to that. Some of you were not born in 2002, so you can't. But here's what happened. Apparently, the Americans, right? Ooh, the evil Americans. So they put the Canadian flag on their locker room floor in, in the hockey. Like anybody that's played hockey or knows anything about hockey, the most gross place is the floor 
of the hockey locker room because that's where like people spit and and uh, they, they walk all over there and guys are doing other like cleaning out their nose and their sinuses and I don't want to go into all the details but like the, the floor of the hockey room is is not a pleasant place okay they supposedly they took our flag and they put it on the floor and also what happens on the floor well you walk all over the floor with your sharp skates and apparently they put our flag on the floor floor of the, the of the locker room and they walked all over it and they put it where in the, in the most detestable place in a hockey arena right and when we heard that as a country all of a sudden it became more than just about we gotta win to get the gold but it became you have you have disrespected our country and and now that you've disrespected our country we have to win this game for Canada we all gotta rally together and we gotta beat those Americans because how dare they take our flag and put it on the floor? Well now magnify that like more than a hundred times. And this isn't about a flag and this isn't about our country. This is about Jesus. This is about trampling the Son of God underfoot. How do you trample the Son of God underfoot? Well what you do is you go and think with me now for a second. Think back to the, the, the crucifixion. Think as Jesus was, was hanging on the cross and the nails were, were going through his, his, his wrists and through his feet and, and his sweat and his blood was pouring and he was dying and he was taking his last breath. And think of somebody looking at Jesus at that time and looking at him and seeing as he's, as he's giving everything he can give. And somebody says, yeah, you know, that's really good. That, 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 that's, that's, that, that, that's a great thing that you did. But have you got a plan B? Because plan A doesn't work for me. I'm wondering, you know, like, like, like that's your plan A. Okay, fine. But what's plan B? And maybe even there's a plan C. Like, is there another way? I, I, I like the way that you've provided here, and it's great and all, but it just doesn't really work for me. Like, like maybe there's another way. Maybe there's some other options out there that I could go with instead of that one. When, when we do that as people, if we do that as people, we become exposed to the truth of what Jesus has done, and we look at what Jesus has done, and we go, there must be another way. Like, in, in Canada, we like options. We don't like things to be really narrow. We like things to be broad and vast. We don't like to think that there's only one way, and all the other ways are wrong. We think that's kind of arrogant. you got to have more than one way, don't you? No, when you look at what Jesus has provided on the cross for all of us, the once for all sacrifice, and you go, that's great, but there must be another way. You're trampling the Son of God underfoot. And that is what the apostate does. He looks and he knows option A, but goes, thanks, but no thanks, I'm going to go with option B. There must be an option B, and God needs to provide for me an option B. There's no option B. And God looks at that and he sees it in, in, in a light that is like trampling the Son of God underfoot. And then he goes on to say that, that this deliberately keep on sinning too has with it that treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant. Well, what's the blood of the covenant? The blood of the covenant is Jesus' blood. Because Jesus' blood, his, the life is in the blood. So when it talks about the blood all the time, I know Christians talk about blood, and it's like, what's all this deal with blood? The life is in the blood. So what it's saying is, is it's saying Jesus gave his life. When we say Jesus gave his blood, we're saying Jesus gave his life for us. And what, what the apostate does is he treats um, as an unholy thing Jesus' blood. So basically what he's saying is he's saying, well, yeah, you know, Jesus spilled his blood, but you know there were these animals over here, bulls and goats and everything else that spilled their blood too, and that's just as relevant. Or to say, like, um, you know, well, Jesus, didn't he die with, like, a, a criminal on his right and a criminal on his left? They spilled their blood too. They were crucified. Everybody's blood that was spilt, I mean, it's one blood is no different than the next. One life is no different than the next. There's nothing special about Jesus and his blood and how he died. Lots of people have died for people. This is treating as an unholy thing. You see, holy means to be set apart, to be special, 
To not just be commonplace or like everybody else. When we look at the sacrifice that Jesus made and we're like, that's no different than any other sacrifice that people have made. We are treating as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant. And then he says, and who has insulted the spirit of grace? This is referring to the Holy Spirit. So first, we're, we're basically insulting as an apostate. We're insulting the whole trinity. Because the Father provided the Son. That was his only way. That was his option A. And we go, option A? Nah, there must be an option B. Insulted the Father. We look at Jesus and we go, yeah, you paid an awesome price for people. That's great. But so did a lot of other people. So big deal. We insulted the Son of God. And now we insult the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God, his whole number primary purpose as the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is to draw attention to the Son, is to draw attention to Jesus. You know, when the Spirit is truly working in us and, and bringing fruit out of our lives and impacting other people through, through us, what our lives are actually doing is our lives are causing people's attention to be drawn to Jesus. You see, if you're somebody who's doing all your things that you're doing and you're doing it for your own sake or for your own attention, then it's probably your flesh that's causing you to do those things because when the Holy Spirit is really working in a person, that person's attention is drawn away from the individual who the Spirit is working through and their attention is actually drawn to Jesus. And so, you know, um, it's an insult to the Spirit of grace when these kind of things happen because the Spirit is the one who actually enlightens people. You see, I believe the Holy Spirit starts working in a person before they're a believer. The Holy Spirit starts working in a person and bringing conviction of sin and bringing this awareness that there is a God who loves them and has made a way, one and only way for them. The Holy Spirit is the one who um, helps us understand Scripture and helps us get this insatiable appetite for Scripture. Like at first when you're reading the Bible and you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're going to look at this book and be like, I don't know why people make such a big deal out of this thing. It's kind of boring. But when you actually have the Holy Spirit living in you, or, or, or working in you, maybe not living in you yet, but working in you, He begins to give you an interest in the things of the Lord. He gives you an interest in His Word. That isn't something you just happen to have. It's, it's something that the Holy Spirit is doing in you. So He's bringing all of these things about in that person, and He's bringing them all these things about in that person to bring them to a place where they're going to not just be a person who's on the fence. Do I go this way or don't I? But they're going to be a person that truly, 100%, is, is on board with it. And the, and the apostate has gotten so close, and then they turn back. So verse 30 says, For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Then it says, It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, earlier in verse uh, 27, it said, what is left for those that turn away from option A, from, from God's provision of salvation? It says, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You know, a lot of times I, I've even heard churches, they just don't preach about this anymore because it's like, I don't know, I don't, don't want to preach about hell and about the fact that People who go to an eternity without Jesus go to an eternity of hell where they are. there's nothing left for them. There is no more sacrifice that remains, as it says in verse 26. All they can expect when they go is a fearful expectation of judgment and raging fire that will consume them. And not, not, not so that they will just be burned up, but so that they will be in suffering forever. This is a troubling passage. This is a troubling theology of Scripture. And, and sometimes people will look at that and they'll be like, well, I think the Bible talks about that sometimes because it just really wants to scare us into heaven. It wants to scare the hell out of us, in a sense. Like, use that in a derogatory way. But, like, in reality, it's like, is that what the Bible is doing? Just trying to scare the hell out of us so that we don't ever go to hell? So that, oh, we'll talk about hell and we'll talk about consuming fire. And we'll talk about, you know, all that is left for you is judgment if you walk away from God's provision of salvation. Is that what it's about? Is, is, it, is it somehow manipulative because it's trying to manipulate you into, into believing something that you don't want to believe? 
just using fear? No. The Bible talks about it over and over and over again because it's real. It's real. And, and the Bible doesn't want anybody to go to eternity in ignorance about what happens to those who reject the offer of salvation that God has provided. If we, if we reject that opportunity, that's all that's left for us. And the Bible wants to be very clear about that because it doesn't want anyone to die and then wake up the next day and, how did I get here? I don't understand. I'm so confused. I, I, I didn't see this coming at all. Well, if you read scripture, you couldn't miss it because it's just filled with warning about that because it's real. If I knew there was some grave danger that was out there that was going to get you today, let's say I, I just say I had a, 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 an ability to be able to tell like exactly what's going to happen this afternoon. I knew one of you was going to get into a serious car accident. How could I just sit back and, and roast a hot dog and, and, and chit chat about the weather when I know that one of you is going to be killed in a serious car accident today? If I knew one of you was going to be killed in a serious car accident today, I would be going to you and I'd be warning you and I'd be saying, look, if you go down that road, you're going to die. So don't go down that road. There's a way that you can be avoid that. And I would, I, I would be unapologetic about it. I'd be like, this is really serious. You really need to listen. I would not be, let's just, no worry, you know, all, all everybody be happy. I'd be like, this is serious. And this is what the author is doing. See, and this is a serious thing. And maybe you might wonder, you know, why, why would people walk away? Why would they walk away from the faith? Why, why would they ever be an apostate? You know, there are reasons for that. Number one is persecution. It says in the Bible, it says that if, if anyone wants to live a godly life, they will be persecuted. And the author here is going to switch to talking a little bit about the persecution that these ones that he's writing to have already experienced. If we look at verse uh, 32, now he's saying, again, think about him like this coach who's, he's challenged them and he said, okay, guys, this is serious. We really have to focus on this now. But now he's encouraged them he's, and he's giving them reasons to think, you're not going to give up. You're going you're to keep going. And, and, and here's some of the reasons why. Verse 33 says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in great conflict full of suffering. So his recipients have already been through some very difficult things. Verse 33, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. You see, that's where persecution starts. Persecution starts with being exposed to insult and persecution. Did you realize that if you want to live a godly life, even in our world today, and I think it becomes more and more prevalent, you are going to be insulted. Your reputation is going to be attacked. You're going to have people giving you the anywhere from, oh, come on, you can't really believe in that, do you? Only morons believe in that. To, I can't stand you. Because you stand against the things that I believe. And if you're going to stand against the things that I believe, then I'm going to try to destroy your reputation any way that I can think of. That's where persecution starts. It starts with words. It starts with things that people talk about, uh, about the person who's standing for the Lord. This is where it starts, but, but it doesn't stop there. It gets worse. And they had experienced some of that. It says verse 33, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. So now you're being persecuted not for what you said, but you're being persecuted for standing with somebody who has been speaking the truth. You get persecuted for that. Then verse 34, you suffered along with those in prison. So now these people were actually taken to prison. And they were joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. So your property was just taken from you for your faith. Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So these people, they're, they're, they're literally their stuff, their cars, their, I mean, this is back then, so they didn't have cars, but, but their stuff, right? Their houses, their property, their land, their, 
the, the things that they value, the things that we value in this world were just taken from them because of their faith. And they were able to say, that's okay. We'll let that stuff go. I'm not going to give up my faith. I'm not going to walk away from what I know is true. I'm not going to walk away from God's provision of salvation just because I lose some stuff that's really important to me. If they're going to take my stuff, then they take my stuff. I'm going to keep persevering. I'm going to keep moving forward. And they were doing that. They lost some stuff. Verse 33, 35, sorry. So do not throw away your confidence. Here he's saying, guys, you have lost some things. You have experienced some persecution. But don't respond to that by throwing away your confidence. Confidence here is another word for faith. Never, never consider that. Don't even, don't even consider that as an option. Don't throw away your confidence. Because it will be richly rewarded. You know why we can persevere through hardships as believers? Because we know this isn't the final chapter. We know that this is just... You know, if, if you're a believer today, if you're truly a believer, then right now is, is probably almost the worst things are ever going to be for you in your life. Today is. Like you're sitting in a chair, you're listening to me talk. I mean, that is pretty bad. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> and we're out here at camp, we're enjoying the nice sunshine, and we're, we're, we're you know, how can this be the worst things are ever going to be? Well, yeah, things might get a little bit worse for you here in this life, but this life is the worst it's ever going to be if you're a believer today. Because what we have in store, what we have to look forward to is so much better. But on the flip side, if you're not a believer today, then right now is the best your life is ever going to be. It's the best. Because what you have to look forward to is way, way worse. You know, there's an author, a Christian author, that actually, no, I don't think the guy is actually a Christian, but anyway, it's not for me to judge. He writes a book that says, your best life now, your best life now, this is a national bestseller, your best life now. Now is not your best life if you're a believer. Now is like close to the worst it's ever going to be. In fact, I, in some ways I want to make the case for if you're truly following Jesus, it's the worst because... All we have to look forward to still in this life is getting closer to Jesus, following him more closely, getting to know him better. So even as we go through some hard things, God will bring great things out of that. And life is going to get even better here. But then as we pass away and go into the next life, it's going to be way better. So your best life is not now. If you're a believer, if you're not a believer, it is your best life now. So, apostasy. People walk away from the faith because of persecution. People, the Bible also talks about, I'll just run through these really quickly, they walk away from the faith because of false teaching. False teaching is very serious. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10 says that there will come a time when people just want to gather around them, a whole bunch of teachers, to tickle their itching ears and, and only have their ears hear the things that they want to hear. Sounds like... Uh, Places where they never talk about what happens after people die because they're not believers. False teaching is dangerous. Neglect. Um, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, it said, How shall we escape if we ignore so great of salvation? People just through neglect can, can come dangerously close to apostasy. We don't want to ignore. When God is stirring in our heart, when he's, he's moving us to do something, when he's prompting us to take action, we need to do it. The best time to obey is right now. If you miss those opportunities to obey, you're, you're wandering yourself into a, a sort of a neglectful life that can lead to apostasy. Um, clinging to the old is a big one. And that was a big one for, the, uh, for the, the recipients of Hebrews. They were constantly thinking about the good old days when we were following the Jewish faith and, and it was so the way we knew it always to be. And, and I think as people today, we all grew up believing something. And even though there was a lot of not good stuff, we all look at the past with rose-colored glasses, as they say. We always can look at like, oh, do you remember back in the, in the 80s or the 90s or, you know, some of the 2000s, whatever. Can you all think back like 10 years ago in your life? And, and, and especially for us as adults, we look back at those years and we're like, oh, those are such good years. We should get out of those back. Sometimes people, when they're, when they're following the Lord, 
they can look back at what they believed back 10, 20 years ago and go, that was good. I love those good old days. Let's go back to that. That's one of the things that people can walk away from the faith for. Um, and, and the last one, forsaking uh, the Christian fellowship. You know, we talked about that last week, but in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, we're told, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. What we're doing right now, gathering together as God's people, is so important to us avoiding the dangers of apostasy. So, let's keep going here. I'm just going to wrap this up here in a few minutes. Um, verse 36 says, you need to persevere. You need to persevere. You need to keep going. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Verse 37, for in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Let's not lose sight of the fact that Jesus is, is coming back for his church. We always want to keep that in mind. Even though it's been a long time for us, let's not lose sight of the fact that today might be the day when he returns. It's going to motivate us to keep going. Verse 38, and, and but by righteousness, one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. You know, it's interesting. That is a quote from Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2. And that, that verse, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, is quoted three different times in the New Testament. And one particular time, it's quoted, the stress is on the just shall live by faith. So if, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if somebody has experienced justification, you will live by faith. And then another time it's talked about by faith. But here, it's, it's stressing that this is how we live. This is how we keep going. The righteous one will live. We will keep persevering. By faith, by trusting. And then it says, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Okay, the last verse. But we do not belong to those who shrink back. So he's warned them now about apostasy, but now he's saying, but I don't believe that to be true of you guys. I don't believe that to be true. I don't believe that you guys are apostate. I don't believe that you guys are going to shrink back. I don't believe that you guys are going to walk away from the faith. There's great danger if you're in that place and you come to that fork in the road as a person who, am I going to fully give my life to this or am I going to turn back and go that way? That's a dangerous place to be. But he's saying, I, I think when you guys get to that fork in the road, I think most of you already have come to that fork in the road, you've made the right choice. And you're not going to shrink back. You're not going to go back and you're not going to walk away from the Lord. You're going to keep going. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Some of your translations might have the word instead of faith there, but believe. And this Greek word is in the present tense. Why is that important? Well, because the present tense means continuously believing. And let me just close with this concept. Is that the author isn't really concerned and God isn't concerned, and I'm not concerned about when you first believed. I'm not so much concerned about that. It's great. You had your experience. For me, it was like I was eight years old at Bible camp, and then there was other points in my life after that. And for you, you have some other story, right, of when you first believed. And that's great. Yeah, I, I, I'm interested in that story, sure. But that's not the thing that's most interesting to me. It's not when you first believed. I'm also not really interested in those who say, well, I don't believe yet, but one day I will believe. I'm not sure when that's going to be, but one day sometime in the future, down the road, I will make that choice and I will believe. You see, what the author is really concerned about here is, do you believe today? It's a continuous action. The, the righteous will live by faith. Those that will not shrink back when persecution comes or when neglect is seeping in or when false teaching is running rampant or when, when it seems tempting to just avoid the gathering together with God's people. The righteous will live by faith. A continuous action. So it's not really that concerned about when you believed. It's not really that concerned about you might believe sometime down the road. 
the, the, the concern is, where are you at today? Today, do you believe? Today, do you believe? And if you do, then let's just continue to, to stick together. Let's continue to, to walk this walk. Let's continue to, to hike up that mountain no matter how tough it gets. Let's continue to face whatever it might be that this world might throw at us. But we need to continue together. We need to continue together. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time that we've had this week. I thank you for those that are here just to enjoy the service this morning, but I also thank you for those of us that have been here all weekend just getting to know each other better. It's such an important part of our ability to persevere through whatever comes. Lord, we need to just keep on gathering together, encouraging each other, reading your word, walking through the, the, the verses and understanding the passages. Lord, I pray for anybody here today who might be at that fork in their road. Or maybe they've been kind of here at church or even here at camp this weekend or they've been rubbing shoulders with your people, Lord, but they know that they have not really fully committed their lives to you yet. They're still kind of at that place where they're thinking, maybe I should turn back. Maybe I should, should, should give up on this and not keep going down this road. And I pray that if there's anybody there today, Lord, that you would just help them to have a conversation with somebody over lunch or um, just to spend some time with you that would just cement that in their minds that, that they're ready no matter what may come to just persevere, to, to keep going, to not shrink back, to not be guilty of the sin of apostasy. We never want anyone to be guilty of that. We never want it to be true of any of us that we went out from among the people because we were never really part of the people. So Lord, help us to, to just uh, really reflect today on all that you've done, to not treat um, your plan as something that's a good option, but I'm sure there's other options out there to, to look at the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ as just another story about someone who gave their life for somebody, but that it's not a commonplace thing. It's a, it's a once for all sacrifice that we never want to treat as common. We want to remember that that is holy, the holy blood of the covenant. Lord, help us to continue to um, walk in right relationship with the Holy Spirit. That as the Holy Spirit enlightens us and brings things to our attention in our lives that need to change or prompts us to do something, to, to obey. Lord, I pray that we would be people that would not put off obedience, but that we would obey immediately. And that we would just keep following you. And, and that as we do that, Lord, the Holy Spirit would work mightily through us so that our lives would draw attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we, um, we pray that you just continue to help us to see that we, are, we, we can be victorious in this and, uh, and, and to keep living our lives by faith. A continuous action, Lord, that we don't believe months, years ago. We don't believe sometime in the future. We believe right now. Right now we believe and we choose to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name.